Hi everyone. Um, I, uh, I've really been enjoying the conversation um, this morning so far and living uh, in increasing terror as um, speaker after speaker has cannibalised essentially what I want to talk to you about for the next 10 minutes. Um, so I apologise in advance if this sounds a little repetitive or builds on some themes that we've already explored quite thoroughly today. Um, and also, I, um, I'm not a copyright expert. Um, I, I'm very firmly from the, um, uh, the sort of field of um, creators and consumers. Um, but uh, hopefully some of the insights I'm going to share with you today uh, will provide some sort of uh, context for the very interesting poli policy discussions that Caroline uh, had um, forecast at the beginning of this session. Uh, I'm the director of the Brisbane Writers Festival and I've only been in that role for a little while. Um, and as uh, the director of a writers festival, I spend a lot of my time thinking about um, readers and what are some creative ways for me to serve the interests of readers and to bring them together. Prior to starting at the festival, I was for about six and a half years the director of the Queensland Writers' Centre. And so in that role, my mission was to try to help emerging writers to have sustainable careers. So for most of the last decade, I've spent um, my professional life thinking about um, what does sustainable models for writers and readers mean and, uh, and how can we create uh, a balance of interest for those two groups. Um, and one of the things that's always struck me in both of these roles is that uh, the organisations whose job it is to actually bring readers and writers together uh, are often the ones who tend to create the most hurdles and frustrations for both those groups in successfully having a dialogue with one another. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but first what I wanted to, to talk to you about is um, an area of enduring interest of mine, I've been spending a lot of time steeped in um, the area of digital publishing and, and book futures. And to have a look at some of the ways that reading and writing behaviour has changed as it has become increasingly networked. And one of these ways, certainly for reading, is that when really when, uh, when the internet came along, uh, when the World Wide Web came along, it effectively severed the connection between uh, the content that we're interested in consuming and the container in which it arrives. So it liberated that content from the um, necessity of having it delivered to us in any particular format. And in the case of books, uh, which is sort of the focus of my um, area, uh, it meant that it didn't have to be delivered in a printed container anymore. But the other the consequence of the web and uh, of us reading and writing in a networked environment is that it also moved us towards a community, a, a, a social context um, for reading. And certainly one of the things we know is that reading is very much a social behaviour. Um, we enjoy talking about books, we enjoy tweeting about books, we enjoy recommending books to our friends and sharing them with one another and lending them to one another. Um, and we engage in all kinds of social behaviours when it comes to reading. Uh, we particularly enjoy uh, sharing samples of text um, that inspire us or that move us or that we, want, that we find funny, that we want to share with people. Um, but also in an academic or scholarly context, this becomes very important as well. This is a, a, an image from a... Um, a, uh, a, a WordPress-based uh, plugin, essentially, that allows text to be annotated, um, and it moves the comments about particular sections of text right up beside where that text has been highlighted, so that readers can actually see a conversation that's taking place about that passage in relation to the original text. And what I find interesting about this particular plugin is that obviously being in a web-based context, it's asynchronous. So this could be a, a conversation that's taking place right now in a classroom full of students, or it could be a conversation that's taking place between readers who are separated by decades. Um, and that's an interesting way of bringing all of that together in one, one context. Um, but we also enjoy uh, sort of annotating and sharing uh, simply because we are fans and we love uh, the writers and the books that we love and we want the rest of the world to know about them and we want to extend that experience for ourselves and for our friends as well. Um, and William Gibson, uh, who's a science fiction writer from Canada, uh, sort of encountered this phenomenon um, earlier in his career when he published a book called Pattern Recognition 
fantastic novel, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, when he found that uh, not long after the book was published, uh, fans had got together and created a website which included basically a, a Google reference to every single term in the book. That book in particular is chock full of uh, pop cultural references, um, references to places and technology, products, brands, that sort of thing. And uh, somebody had Googled every term, every place that included photographs of every location in the book, basically built a massive site that was compiled of nearly every reference into the book, uh, in the book. Um, and this was all done as a collaborative volunteer effort of fans of William Gibson. And uh, the follow-up to this book, Spook Country, uh, the same thing happened, but it actually happened before the book had even been officially released. So fans had gotten a hold of an early, probably an advanced reader um, version of the novel and had actually pulled all of that off uh, and it was ready to go at the time that, that average readers were able to buy and read the book. And uh, it prompted Gibson to say that every text today has a kind of spectral quasi-hypertext surrounding it all of the information that's contained in the book, but it extends our experience out into the web that we can share and link to other texts, other um, pieces of creativity. Um, and of course, you know, even just in, in plain old social context where we want to tell people why we love the books that we've just read and recommend them to each other, uh, we engage in a lot of discussion. And so you get communities like Goodreads online, which now has 10 million users and um, is fast replacing our traditional methods of finding and recommending uh, books to one another. But it's not just reading that's social, of course, there's also writing that has become more social as a result of being in a networked context. Um, we, I think, have always enjoyed, uh, I think, I personally believe that creators are not their stereotype where they write alone in a, in a, you know, a, a lofty garret. Um, I think that writers actually enjoy collaborating with one another, connecting with another, telling each other about what they're working on. And if you, if you go back through history and look at the um, uh, you know, salons and um, artists collectives of um, you know, throughout the last few hundred years, you can see lots of examples of that. And uh, that's accelerated and amplified in, in the web-based context. So you get uh, communities like Wattpad, another Canadian startup, Actually, uh, through this talk, there's a bit of a Canadian theme going, so there's a whole bunch of innovation happening up there. Um, Wattpad is an online, a free online community for writers to share their stories with readers. Uh, it sounds pretty much like a microcosm of the web because there's certainly no barriers for writers to upload their work now and share it if they want to. Um, but Wattpad has been able to uh, really generate a, a really strong reading community around the people who are participating in it. It now has 10 million readers a month on the site viewing fiction that's been uploaded by members um, and they're spending two billion minutes a month reading stories on the site. Um, more than 500 Wattpad uh, users have had more than a million views of these stories. These are all shared freely, there's no commercialization of the um, of the texts that are uploaded either from the writer side or the reader side. Um, but some, uh, some writers who contributed stories to Wattpad have generated such a big online following uh, that they've attracted publishing offices, offers from major publishing companies, in which case they then take that text down so it's no longer freely available and it becomes subject to the ordinary commercial practices of the, publishing, of the trade publishing workflow. Um, publishing is also becoming more networked as a result of uh, the web, um, mainly because it means that we've been able to disaggregate the processes that are involved in publishing. So it, no, it's no longer a requirement for you to work with a publishing house who can do everything for you to get your book printed and distributed or made into an e-book and distributed. Um, it used to be the case that because they owned the means of both distribution, but creation and distribution publishers were pretty much your gatekeeper to a reading community. Now, of course, they're not. Um, and web-based tools means that individual writers or collectives of writers can use um, individual services that make up publishing um, as they need to. It may be that they hire a freelance editor, it may be that they hire a book designer, um, and then they take charge of the process of creating a book and uploading it to Amazon themselves. But whatever the case, they actually get to choose which parts of that process they want to participate in. 
And then I also think what's another interesting, I didn't have a picture of it up here, but there's an interesting startup who's, that's come out of South Africa called Paperwrite, um, which is looking at the problem of last mile distribution in Africa. Um, in Africa, of course, there isn't, uh, in many countries, an established retail distribution network for goods and services. Uh, and so it means that it's harder to distribute books and for schools and communities that need to get a, get a hold of learning materials in particular, uh, this can be a very expensive and, and um, difficult proposition. Uh, so what Paperwrite is actually um, doing is taking cheap printing technology, copying machines and laser printers and um, things that are easily obtainable and serviced uh, that can be run by schools and small shops. Um, and they've created an easy uh, pro forma based licensing framework for those organisations to be able to license content that they can print themselves locally and distribute to their communities. Um, so that's a really interesting response to um, sort of copyright friction in those communities. Um, I think just moving on from that, um, what I began my talk was to say that um, I think that the biggest frustrations for readers and writers to coming together um, are often caused by the organisations who ostensibly are there to help those two um, groups to meet. Um, and most of the time, these are not uh, what I consider to be copyright problems. Uh, they are problems that are caused by commercial practices. Obviously, those commercial practices stem from the power of, uh, of the copyright legislation that's given to those um, organisations, but by and large these are private contractual arrangements between organisations that create problems for both writers and readers. Now we've talked a lot about territorial rights already in this um, conference today, so I'm sort of loath to bring it up again. Um, but I think it's a really good example of how this is a, is a sort of looming problem for both readers and writers. Um, we already know for readers why territorial rights can be a frustration. They're a frustration for readers in a country like Australia, where we are a very small English language speaking and reading market. Um, and yet the locus of power for the English language publishing industry is in the United States and in Europe. Um, and so uh, what happens is that the, the global publishing industry is essentially founded on the ability for uh, publishers in individual countries to be able to license the exclusive right to publish a work in that particular region. Um, and a lot of their business model is built on that monopoly for that region. Uh, and they try to implement that in a digital context in which readers now can see what is actually available to consumers in other regions and how, um, what sort of formats are being made available to them and what prices are being made available to them. And I have to say there's nothing more frustrating than this example where you might search for a book by an Australian author whose publisher is actually a US publisher who only has the US uh, publishing rights uh, to this particular ebook, for example. Um, and so as an Australian reader, I can't purchase, uh, with money that I'm willing to plonk down, uh, a copy of this book by this Australian, uh, Australian author. Now obviously that's a frustration to me as a, as a reader, but it's an intense frustration to the author as well, because the authors end up getting emails from their fans all around the world saying, I wanted to buy your book and it's not available to me. And they end up getting all the complaints sent to them uh, and then turning to their publishers and saying, why is it so? I don't understand why you can't make my book available or readers who are willing to purchase my book um, can't get it. And so you end up with responses from readers like this, uh, which is a fantastic website I encourage you to check out called Lost Book Sales. Um, which is essentially a database where readers who encounter this problem can go and log their frustration. They can actually fill out a form and say, I tried to purchase this book. I tried to, you know, and you can actually tell them what the title was, uh, what format you tried to purchase it in, uh, you know, the reason why you weren't able to purchase it, and you can choose from a, a drop down box. The most common reason cited on here is. Uh, um, is geographical restrictions. Um, sometimes it's price, sometimes people object to the price, but uh, by and large, geographical restrictions tend to be the most common reason on lost book sales. Um, and then you can also log what the outcome was. 
Um, and sometimes it's that you went and purchased another book. Uh, sometimes it's that you didn't purchase anything at all. Um, and you can leave all of this information. This all sits up on the website for people to peruse. I don't know how many publishers are regularly perusing it to see uh, what business they're missing out on. Um, now these are, sorry, these are all um, commercial practices that uh, enable uh, particular businesses in in certain regions to be able to thrive by having a monopoly to serve that region. And that actually is no small thing in Australia where we have the same problem that uh, Tim was talking about and that's a problem of scale. We've only got 22 million potential readers available to us. Uh, not even that, if you're thinking about the reading population that's able to purchase books. Um, and it's, it certainly doesn't scale on a digital, uh, on a digital context where you're only charging uh, you know, a few dollars for each title. Um, even if you're able to reduce uh, your distribution costs, uh, there's still quite a lot of costs that go into publishing uh, works. And, um, and so you have mid-sized publishers in Australia that uh, have actually grown over the last 20 years on the back of the ability to buy in Australian rights from overseas and sell them locally. Um, publishers like Text and Scribe, uh, a lot of the university presses that operate as trade publishing models, uh, they are businesses which gain commercial advantage by having that monopoly. And so we actually are um, risking those businesses if we want to look at trying to open up those geographic regions. My view is that uh, this is a, um, uh, this is a problem that, that can't be solved by trying to preserve a monopoly that, um, you know, that is going to be effectively eroded by readers who engage in copyright infringing behaviour in order to ease their frustration about not getting access to the content that they want. Um, and instead of us trying to uh, uh, control their behaviour through copyright legislation, we need to try to reform those commercial practices so that we reduce the friction between writers and readers coming together. Um, and some writers try to take this into their own hands, like the author um, Paolo Coelho, who was actually caught by his US publisher about three years ago, seeding his own novels on file sharing networks <laughs> so that they could be spread more, uh, more easily online. Uh, eventually he came to an agreement with them about that, but I'm not convinced that it doesn't still happen and that he's not the perpetrator of that. Um, but at the end of the day, for me, what this boils down to is um, a response by uh, publishers and distributors to try to, um, uh, to c control the agenda um, of customers who they feel are moving from a physical product to an online product. And in reality, that kind of misses the point because really the shift that we're seeing is not a move from physical to digital. And a lot of the copyright debate get situated there and, and we get really sort of, you know, uh, obsessed with that. Really what this is about is moving from a context of scarcity to abundance. And it's really publishers and writers for that matter who understand how they can compete in a, an age of content abundance uh, who will be able to thrive. Thank you.